So I'm going old school. Can you hear me in the back with this? Great. Um, uh, very happy to be here. Thank you. Um, so similar to the earlier discussion, Mira and I have selected a group of images to really prompt the conversation today. And the work that's on view that you're seeing there uh, is called Beauty. We thought we would start with this because it was the first work that I ever saw by Mira in 1992 in the exhibition Slow Painting at PS1. And so, but bef actually before we do that, I'm just curious about two things, I'm sort of picking up on the earlier conversation about the audience and seduction or disgust. Um, how many people have actually ever seen a work by Mira in person, a painting? Hey, okay. way to go. Okay. <laughs> how many people have ever read anything by Mira, either in book form, online? Okay, all right, so in the spirit of the know your audience, here's, <laughs> we're, we're off at the races. Um, so, Beauty. Uh, this is a work I came upon in the galleries of PS1. I didn't know who made it. And I looked at it and thought, this would be the painting that Frida Kahlo, having left Diego and taken some uh, critical theory classes, would have been making <laughs> if she was alive. Um, it struck me as a, uh, almost uh, an ecstatic painting, a kind of religious painting, a confessional painting a call to action, um, a lot of things. I mean, I think this is, a, in, in a way, an interesting touchstone, and we thought that we would start with this sort of biographical moment between us, but also maybe a symbolic one. So um, in a discussion that Mira had with uh, the Brooklyn Rail a while ago, she said this phrase, my hope for painting is that it can connect to contemporary culture. And so I think when I first saw this painting, it was very clear to me that here was a work that seemed like it was not only trying to do that, but was doing that. And so maybe my first question really is about why you feel painting is this medium, this form, this history, that is suitable to engage with contemporary culture in the way that you'd like to. It's funny, I thought you were going to ask the question the opposite way, which is why do, you, why do I feel that I need to defend painting from the idea that it wouldn't be um, the, the appropriate medium. Um, I'm and going to you... <laughs> surprise you all afternoon. Oh, so good. Yeah, okay. I, I want him to do that. Um, well, I do, I mean, my answer is, is in a way reflective of my feelings about painting, which is that painting is the medium that I was really born into, and it was, it was the primary medium of art. Um, and... Yet by the time I became an artist, it was already sort of under, it's always been under attack all through, perhaps all through the 20th century. But by the time I got to school, it was definitely a moment of break. And I went to a school where that break was, you know, taking place in a very productive way. And, and then also this painting was made after, in 1991. And I had just uh, spent that la the decade of the 80s re-educating myself on my own at, long after I'd gone to school in uh, critical theory and feminist theory. And also it was a decade where the work that was done by women was um, not supposed to be painting. And it wasn't primarily painting. If you think, you know, it was like a, 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 a litany, you know, Cindy Sherman, Sherry Levine, Barbara Kruger, Cindy Sherman, and, and, and Mary Kelly and... Uh, you know, and I was trying my best to get up to speed and reading Lucie Rigaray and, and uh, not so much Lacan, but about Lacan. And, um, and I went in the opposite direction. I did not actually paint in oil until the mid-'80s, and then I fell in love with the medium. So I, somehow I tried to bring the essence of painting, which was under attack, uh, to, to feminist to feminism and to feminist theory. And so th this is actually the first painting after a group of paintings will show one uh, where there was only the body um, or the sexualized body. I had worked with language much earlier, which will also show, uh, ch shows a couple of images. This was the first painting where I brought the two together in a particular way. Um, and the way I saw it, it was based on um, a, a saying in French um, il faut souffrir pour être belle. You have to suffer to be beautiful, but it's gendered in, in French, so it's not like you have to suffer to be handsome. Uh, so, 
Um, so I so so I chose these two sort of unevenly shaped breasts, and then the idea of this. I always thought that was so weird as a young woman. I thought that was a very very weird imperative um, about femininity and being a woman that you had to suffer to be beautiful. So here, out of the word beauty, um, is a kind of crown of thorn of of blood, and so in a way, what Stuart was picking up certainly, I think you were you were picking up on things that were in the painting, which is that. Like Frida Kahlo, I was looking at Flemish painting. That's one of the, my favorite uh, areas. And the, even though the next works we're going to show you are about Judaism, I was certainly brought up looking at a lot of Christian art. And, um, and all those things entered into this work. Yeah, you used the phrase born into mm -hmm. art. So I think we, we, we sort of, by... by uh, for all kinds of reasons, we wanted to show a work by your father and a work by your mother, um, and I and I wanted to ask you about this idea. I mean, I grew up. My father was a Sunday painter and was involved with photography. I went to museums regularly as a kid, and so you know, this is not making sand castles. This is like being in New York culture, and aware of uh, the craft and dedication being addressed to making things that your parents exemplified. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about the work that your father was doing here, uh, and one or two other images will show, and what it means to grow up watching people make things in a very dedicated way, and those things being uh, driven by ideas of Judaica and, and modernity. Well, the painting that you're looking at is a small gouache painting by my father, Ilya Shore, who was a multi-talented artist. Um, and it's a, it's a very humble painting of a humble scene of a scribe in his home writing and his wife in the kitchen. Um, the women are not supposed to touch the holy texts. They're not holy if women touch them. Um, and, you know, it's a small gouache on board. Gouache was the material of, of my childhood in painting, and which has relevance to my turning to oil. Um, my parents, I always say that they carried very strange or mixed art DNA, and their, their, their DNA has marked my existence in the art world in a, in a kind of position of otherness. But maybe I should say a little bit about my parents just uh, to situate them. Uh, Ilya and Resha Shore, Polish-born Jews, uh, living in Paris before the war, fleeing Paris, just um, transpose onto this, this the, uh, the plot of Casablanca, except Erase Casablanca and um, my father being, he was not a resistance hero, um, but my mother was as beautiful as Ingrid Bergman, and um, I think. And um, so fleeing across Europe, coming to, being fortunate enough to come to America in 1941. And my father came from a very Hasidic background, and he had a kind of medieval guild training as a teenager, as a silversmith, goldsmith, and engraver. My, and then my parents met in art school. So then for him, modernity was a layer over. Um, for my mother, modernity and the school of Paris was the first layer. And, um, and then they went to Paris. They would never have come to America if it wouldn't have been for the war, but they came to America. My father made a living doing uh, these paintings and also Judaica. So if you imagine me, this is a Torah crown, silver with bells. It would pretty much fit on my head. Um, in the apartment I currently live in was a small studio, kind of like a workshop. My father did this when I was about six years old. Or he, he did one like this when I was about six years old. And I remember him coming out of the, the room wearing this crown, his face alight with joy. And... Um, my, as my mother always said, it had a wonderful sonority because actually the bells worked. Um, what an amazing, you know, childhood just to watch him doing this. He had incredible skill. The religion involved in it. You're looking at Moses, um, looking at the tabernacle, the, the and um, and how oddly different than the world that we were living in, that my parents were living in of abstract expressionism. Um, 
My mother was a painter, an abstract painter uh, in the 50s and exhibited her work. But when my father died, she decided that she couldn't support her family as a painter wisely. And um, I chose to show my favorite piece of hers. It's, you're, you're looking at the front and the back of a large pendant called the moon. She did it in 67 before the satellite that went around the moon in 68 photographed the back of the moon. Um, so that was a great point of pride. I took this out of the safe this week to rephotograph it. And when you look at the dark side of the moon, it's almost like you could press your nose right into it. And the profundity of it is enormous as well as the weight. And I also thought a lot about, um, so I got to see my parents making art every day at home. That's the, the short and the tall of it. But with the religious content to the work and... Um, and I thought a lot about my mother, um, what I would call her visual intelligence, because English was maybe her fifth language. She wasn't a theoretical person, a very intelligent person, but she had real visual intelligence, and that's something which I'm not sure that is as respected today as it was then. So I want to just jump from this for a moment, because obviously this is your, your, your watching and being alerted to your parents making things, but also your parents, interestingly enough, coming to the United States, being in New York, doing these things, also had some very interesting friendships. And so friendships and legacies and connectivity to the New York school, which I think we'll come back to later in terms of a, a legacy discussion. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of people that were in your range of exposure uh, who would be the first generation, second generation abstract expressionists in many cases, moving into pop at some point. So thinking of people like Jack Torkov and Red Grooms and a, a very particular generation that you were exposed to and were intimate with. Yeah. Well, um, sometime in the early 50s, when I was still a, a toddler, I think, my parents um, met Jack Torkov and his wife Wally and their family, and at, around the same time met Heim Gross, and his wife, Rini, and Mimi, their daughter, Mimi, who's here. Those were very different parts of the art world, and yet all those people knew each other because the art world in the 30s was much smaller. Um, and I think the, the thing that I take away from it the most was, well, of course, the fact that they were all passionate about art, and they had amazing things in their homes. So I would just look at them while people were talking. But the other thing that I realized much later was that the discussions that were taking place that were really crucial to, uh, to my family was, were things that later when I started to read Clement Greenberg and read back about Abex and, you know, uh, many years later, were the discussions that were around the family table, which was the place of craft as a secondary uh, medium, scale, abstraction versus narrative, all, all kinds of things that really have had a big impact on, on my own way of thinking. And it, and it was just odd, because I think that when I first heard them as a child, I just thought, well, this is just my family's uh, story. I didn't realize it was basically the history of, of you know, post-war art was being enacted um, in, these, in these family friendships. And then it's true that um, I became friends with um, Mimi Gross and Red Grooms, and I worked on some of their films, and that uh, some uh, a film that that they made called Tappy Toes, and um, I learned a lot from them, and it gave me um, that is a, a wonderful world that continues to exist. That's not the art world that most people hear about. Um, it was an art world of friendships and creative friendships and a kind of modest art world in a way. And it's been a very sustaining force, which continues to uh, illuminate my life, I would say. So you leave New York, you go to California in the early 1970s. We're looking at a, at a work made under the time when you were at the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia. So the title of this work is The Two Mirrors. And I'm interested, right? Yes. And I'm interested in, uh, at this moment, who these two mirrors are. In the early 70s, what, who were the two mirrors? Um, 
Apparently, this was done from a dream. I have one friend who knew me then, and he remembers my friend Tom Nechtel, a wonderful painter in California. He, rem he was my student, actually, at, at CalArts, and he remembers that I said that this was done from a dream. Um, I'm a Gemini. Let's say that I'm a perfect Gemini in many ways. And so there is a, there's a duality which will come up. You saw that my mother did two sides of the work, both sides. That's, that's part of, of me as well, writer, painter. Um, public, private, a, per a person who loves to speak to a huge number of people in a room but is also quite shy and therefore maybe seems aloof in, in other situations. Um, so those two mirrors, I think, were, um, hey, in those days I was just struggling with losing my virginity and, and you know, just trying to <laughs> deal with feminism and enter the, uh, the world. So those are the, the two mirrors in kind of wild California landscape. It was a, a moment of great transformation for me and, and a, incredibly, um, you know, it was a fantastic experience being um, at CalArts. But I was thinking about this work recently. I, I, on Facebook, I put up this thing that Larry Gagosian had been quoted as saying about to some collector where he described a painting and he said, it's a million dollar painting. It's got, it's colorful, it's got tits, and the guy's a great painter. So I thought, okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's not a million dollar painting. Um, it's not that colorful, but it does have tits. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not a guy. So. <laughs> and I know you for 20 years. If you would have told me we'd be in front of a room filled with this many people talking about losing your virginity, I would have bet, I would have bet against it. But, but that's okay. Um, okay, so you mentioned holy, you mentioned holy script and, and text earlier. Um, these are, we're going to look at a, a, a few works here, um, and I'll just go through them. Uh, and I want to talk to you about the idea that, that you, as you mentioned, this kind of doubleness in writer, painter, uh, public, private. These are a, a series of works we're looking at here, uh, book form, dress form in both cases, writing that is extremely expressive, not necessarily readable. Um, and so already, very early on, the nature of the uh, image as uh, language as image is coming up here, um, and and here a, a a mask. So, can you talk about the ways in which you were using language here? It's uh, diaristic. It's it's expressive. It's private, um, and yet it's finding itself on forms: book, body, mask, which transform the idea of what the text might be saying as well as what's it, what it's doing. Mm -hmm. So what was the impulse to move to writing? And not just, not text, but writing text and the hand in this way. Well, my, my, by the time I left, I, you saw the work that I did at school. By the time I left school, I'd, I'd elaborated a, what I later came to call an agenda. Agenda was not a 70s word particularly, but, the, but, the, but I, I thought I want to, I wanted to um, express what it meant to live in, inside a female body with a mind. I wanted to bring that experience into high art in as intact a form as possible. And so my first idea was that I stuck myself in the work, but very quickly I changed that to my handwriting as the trace of self. And, um, and a form of address. And in this case, these were, these were private addresses aimed, it was private texts, sort of like diaries, letters. All of these works were aimed at an individual guy. Poor guy, I was pity him to think, because in a way it was so obvious that I was, but not to me, that I was making the work, you know, that that was the important thing. And bringing, and I, I, was, I was thinking in those days about how Women are filled with language, but they were, they're not thought of as being filled with language, but they are, you know, they, they are as, as much filled with language as, as any human being. So this was a way of getting that, whether or not you could read the text, you got the impression of language. And that connects back to my father's work, because I, I was never taught to read Hebrew. So his work contained language, it represented language, which I could only experience as image not as anything that I could read. Um, so it's very, that, that's remained very important to me that if, some, if you see some, I always say I paint in English. Um, that means that it might not be um, 
you know, understandable, but I would hope that somebody looking at the work would go, this is language. I, I know language. Um, I know writing. Now writing is an archaic medium, as it turns out. But. The other interesting thing, and, and we often go immediately to the language being used, but something here very early on is your interest in paper, your interest in the nature of frag fragile materials, uh, transparency. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which choice of material, you know, ink, paper, overpainting, underpainting, sort of allowing things to bleed. I think, you know, in this way you're making parallels between the bodily experience and metaphors or politics about uh, how these things are meant to be understood. Well, I, I, the, the odd thing is that I called myself a painter throughout the 70s, but I didn't really paint um, in any sense of the word. Um, I, I think that I felt, I felt comfortable with paper. I enjoyed the malleability of paper. I did like transparency and working from back to forth. And I felt that paper was a good metaphor for self. It's fragility, but also I early on did get a response from audience that there was something rather aggressive about having, apparently, I was told, about having something very fragile in a public space that that actually put the audience or the viewer into a, a, a position that somehow implicated that viewer. And I, that was not, that was initially not my, my idea. But. So I worked with those media for uh, about 10 years and gradually began, I worked in oil at the point, or I switched to oil at the point where I felt that I couldn't do what I wanted to do in those uh, media anymore, and um, that it was no longer, that delicacy was no longer the appropriate metaphor for self. And at that time, would you have been either knowing about uh, speaking directly with Ida Applebrug and Nancy Spiro and people who are also working with paper as a, as a medium, as a vehicle? I didn't, see, I didn't see Nancy Spiro's work until the 80s. And I didn't know of Ida Applebrook's, uh, Applebrook's work, those early works on paper or with paper uh, until I had stopped doing that work. Mm -hmm. I think that's very common that you, you find that you, you, you have resonances with artists rather than influences necessarily. There's a difference between influence and resonance. So um, some of the forms I used at a certain point were related to Louise Bourgeois, but I didn't really learn about her work until the mid-70s and see some amazing drawings on paper at uh, Max Hutchison at the end of the 70s or early 80s. So, um, so it was really more a question of resonance than influence in their, in their case. And I should say, ironically, that I was constantly discouraged from working on paper by my mother, who called me up one day and said, I'll give you $300 if you, were to, if you go buy some oil. <laughs> Because you know, she wanted me to make it in the art world, and she knew that she knew how tough it was if you didn't do it in the master medium of, of paper. And I said, "Well, you can give me the three hundred dollars, but I'll buy food with the three hundred dollars." But when I needed it for my work, I then I then I changed, you know, switched over. So let's moving forward a yeah. little bit here. Um, this is an exhibition that we did together at my then gallery, um, public private. Uh, a work that started to do something as I, as when I first met Mira's work and met her, obviously, I was looking at single paneled individual works and the uh, studio visits that, you know, followed that immediately alerted me to the idea that you were working with ideas about installation and accumulated scale, uh, as well as this idea about language being and cursive language being painted. And this idea that in many cases your language was being absorbed from the culture. It now was not expressive, personal mm -hmm. language uh, from the earlier period, but now it was typical of the period and appropriation and ideas mm -hmm. about this, that you were poaching language, finding language that resonated with you, and now reinscribing it within the context of your, your work. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about this period of work and these ideas about accumulation each painting, like lovingly made and extremely uh, crafted. I know you and I talked at that time about scale and Twombly and very large scale work mm -hmm. and, and, and this idea about building it almost brick by brick. Yeah, I, was, I, I, was, I think early on, I, 
the only way that I can do very large work is to do it through an accumulative process rather than a gigantic painting. Even now, I struggle with the notions of maybe I should make it bigger because no matter what anyone says, bigger is still better. But, um, but I, when I think of it, it just seems like I would be, inf- the image I get is that I would just be inflating something which has its own identity best as a small thing. But I did want to do larger things. And the, these, I call these my Scrabble paintings because, although they're not square, but basically each letter represented uh, the letter of my handwriting, writing out the word public and private. So I had the word public written in the script, cursive script that I'd been taught, and white, black and white. And then private was in my handwriting, blown up in the, through uh, Xerox in those days, and then painted in a ver- as physical a way as I could at that point. And it's, a, it's an interesting painting to me now. I, I haven't seen it since we showed it. Um, because I, the notion of privacy has been coming up in some of the writings that I've been doing, both for meaning and and, uh, and the rail. So maybe we can so move on. yeah, no, let's totally shift to and meaning to to, <laughs> to meaning. Um, and this was one of the things, interestingly enough, I, I remember talking, you know, with you in the early '90s about your involvement with our gallery and the idea that uh, this double role, which I was fascinated with. But even then, you were talking about as somewhat fraught the identity, the, the in a sense, the two the two mirrors. But I was fascinated at that that you had been working with Susan B, who's also here, which is great, um, to create a forum for uh, language and ideas and, and symposia that did not have a easy place in the art writing of that period. And when you speak about community and dialogue and a kind of almost familial art world, um, meaning was in a lot of ways a way to generate some of those feelings and also get ideas out that might not have been able to be out. So what was, me- what, you know, here's issue one. <laughs> what, is, what was meaning about and how did all of that develop? Well, meaning emerged, I think, f- the specific uh, thing that spurred us to do it was that I just decided to sit down and spent two years writing an essay about the representation of women in the work of David Sally and then couldn't get it published. But Susan and, Susan and I had been talking for a number of years. We were part of a critics group of artist critics who would meet once in a while to talk about exhibitions. And we were talking about the impact of kind of new language that had come into art uh, writing in the 80s, this language of, quote, theory. And I think both of us had um, learned some, taken some of the same lessons from feminism in the 70s, which is that if you wanted to create, if, you're, if what you were doing did not correspond to the discourse of the, the, the mainstream discourse of that time, then you had to create your own discourse and your own criticism and your own exhibitions and all of that. And um, so, you know, we were, we just, at one point, just thought, okay. I mean, I always say we were like Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. It was like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do a magazine. I didn't even know what, I mean, she, Susan had a lot more experience of doing that. And, uh, you know, we, we each put up 500 bucks, did all the work, and schlepped it to the post office and sent it to people just the way Ida Applebrook had sent people uh, and we, it, I, it, was, it was an amazing experience. First of all, it was amazing to collaborate because I am a very private person. I'm very involved with studio practice um, alone. Um, but I feel like my life changed from the collaboration, which we've been doing for 20, over 25 years. And, um, but also because we did, when, when you're an artist, you, know, you go to school, you meet people. Then you leave school, and your world begins to shrink a little bit, or at least for me, I could see it shrinking into the friendships that I had from that school period. And doing the magazine was a way of suddenly opening that world again and giving an opportunity for artists to um, express themselves. And I felt when, when I met you and the way you ran your gallery was very much in the same spirit. You were interested in creating community as much as you were in having a traditional gallery. Um, there's, Stuart did this amazing um, 
piece where, or event where he brought in a small printing press into the gallery and a whole bunch of artists were invited to come in. We'd each have a couple of hours, I guess, to work with his help. And then as it went along, the work just went up on the wall. And, it and you generate 200 prints out of nothing. <laughs> um, but, but the interesting thing about this, and I talk with you know, a lot of artists in, in the work that I do as a curator, and, and it is reflective of what you just said, that you, if not given top-down choices, you build them from the sort of bottom up. But there is also something to be said for when you think you have nothing, that's the moment that you act in a very generous, inclusive way. And so the idea of, you know? I yeah, mean, I should say it's true because when, I always think Susan and I, I don't think either of us had a gallery at that point. I'd been ditched by a gallery. And, um, and we, we, we were not um, unknown. We were not not part of the art world. We, we knew people. But in a way, we could not have been more anonymous. And we were free to, you know, within a small community to work. And in a global world, that local community that you have in the end is, is you know, the most real, the most sustaining. And to, to me, the, it, was, it was kind of amazing and sustaining. I would go to the post office a couple of issues later. I wrote an essay called Figure Ground in which I talked about critics' fear of goo, or people who, critic of painting, fear of goo, the goo of painting. And I ran into Guy Goodwin, who's from, I think, Alabama. And he said, I just love that article about goo. <laughs> and, oh, that's so great. You know, it's like a village. I'm living in a village in which, in which this kind of thing can, can happen. And um, so it was, and, but at the, the, the title also has this, the same sort of interruptions that um, my paintings did. So we, we thought of that. We, we worked on the title together and Susan suggested the slashes and I thought that's great because that's the way I'm constructing my paintings, one letter at a time. And it also does something which may be true of not only meaning but the way we work, which is that we're, we're, we stutter and we, we, we have fits and we're interrupted and the idea of all these things moving f uh, fluid, fluidly and easily uh, is, is quite nicely uh, understood by those breaks, mm -hmm. you know. Um, ah. Speaking of fluids. Okay, speaking of fluids. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and when I, when I raised the earlier question about the sort of religious painting, as I came to understand, uh, this body of work by you, uh, War Freeze, which we'll look at in a minute. But the idea about um, an the Annunciation paintings very much, that this, in a sense, a, a painting called Small Ear. Um, <laughs> Mira's titles are great, we'll get to this later. Um, but, but the idea of you know, taking on, in your own way, uh, an iconography about bodies, an iconography about power, masculinity, uh, who has power, who wields it, uh, how can it be shaken. Um, and we can look at a few images from here. Just And so we're now looking at, again, a single, a single image and accumulated series of images. The, the module is always 12 by 16. So th this is part of a major work that I did from, uh, I conceived of it during the, er, the Gulf War, which, mm -hmm. and I decided that I wanted to do a painting about endless militarism and aggression. Um, I didn't realize the war was going to only last 15 days or however many, and then it took me three years to complete the work. Um, but it was done through, it, it, uh, essentially the idea would be a, 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 a sort of ongoing flow of lang language appropriated from military, from the news, that um, would be flowing from sexualized body part to, to body part. And it evolved into a group of sort of discrete sections. Um, this one is part of a abortion decision um, that Sandra Day O'Connor uh, said, you know, you, well, there can be limitations on abortion so long as they don't impose an undue burden on the woman. So I, so I incorporated that. So I was always look, I, at that point I was looking for text from the news. It would just uh, occur to me, and it was, it would, I like texts that would have more than one meaning. So this is the undo part of it, and it's going from a breast for, and a kind of uh, ear, penis, ray gun type of, of shape. Well, and, and the other phrase that was you know, poached by you at this time and runs through this series of works is the phrase area of denial. 
And so area of denial, as you've said, and people may know, was a, was a type of bomb that was developed, and it denied oxygen rather than blowing up actual uh, uh, things. Um, but the idea of that phrase, area of denial, and its ability to speak to any number of uh, issues, the war, the body, our own sense of uh, what we think we can do, should do, um, ways that we sabotage. You want to talk a little bit about areas of denial and your use of that phrase and why it was so potent? Like many of the things that I was painting at the time, it just fell into my lap. I was listening to something on television on the Ted Koppel show in the uh, Nightline, the original Nightline. And he talked about these area of denial weapons, which we had sold to Iraq before the war, and then we were afraid that they were going to use them on us. And they, they were called area of denial weapons because they blew up above ground, denying oxygen to all living things below. And I just immediately, that, that's the way I was working at that point. I just go like, that's it. You know, I reel it in. Um, I thought, you know, the body is an area of denial, um, and, and the body of painting was an area of denial, I felt, as well, at that point. I, we didn't choose those uh, images. The problem with War Freeze is that it was like photographing a pencil, because it was so narrow, it was hard to get back from. All of these are, this is actually new photography, but all, all the rest are scans from old slides and... Um, I'll tell my story. Well, I thought, yeah, something very uh, intriguing was the comment that, that you made uh, to me, which is that you've never seen the piece, <laughs> in um, a sense, that you've the never painting, seen the it painting as intended. Ended, yeah, that's right. I mean, the painting ended up being, we, you know, you showed portions of it. We'd have to wrap it around the corner of the small gallery, um, so that was already a kind of a compromise. But the painting, if it were ever hung at, or installed as it should be, is about 200 running feet. I've never seen it. I have no idea how it would work. And um, this is perhaps a weird story to tell, but I feel like you know it, the current of the times is always what's uh, literally the New York Times is always what's on my mind. Um, waking up this morning, reading the Times about the 1993 show. Um, let me tell you a little anecdote, which I'm telling, even though it's not. Uh, maybe so positive, but it also speaks to the fact that more like I, I've had an odd art career, I would say. Um, and um, so when I was doing this, these paintings, I really did feel that I was, I knew what I, I felt like I knew what I was doing. I was working in painting on ideas that were being worked on by other women artists like Mary Kelly, but not in painting. And so I was mixing the, the you know, theoretical feminist uh, impulses, interest in language, with painting. Um, I was not represented by a gallery at that time. I wrote to Elizabeth Sussman, who I knew personally, and said, I'm not represented by a gallery, um, but I, I think I'm doing something important, uh, blah, blah, blah. I had the first sections of this. Um, the show, the famous 1993, um, Biennial opened, and it was very strongly. It was a very interesting show, but it was very strongly criticized for not having enough painting. And I received a call, which came back to my mind this morning. Um, and to this day, I feel like I hallucinated the call, but I did not hallucinate the call. Um, I received the call from Elizabeth Sussman, and she said, "We made a mistake." They never came to my studio, by the way, but we made a mistake. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, thank you very much. I mean, what am I supposed to do with that information? So that, um, that, oh, that I'm, I, and I've never told this story publicly, but I think that this work um, remains as this great mystery to me. You know, I always envisioned the room that it could be in, because it has to be a fairly large room, that it would go, this was a studio I had at the Marie Wall Sharp, and even there, I, I was able to do more of the piece, but you know, that would wrap all the way around a little bit above eye level, so it would go just above a door, if there was a door, four walls, the whole thing. Um, it would be fantastic. And um, the next work we're going to show is the way it would be punctuated, um, which is um, one, of, one of the political quotes had a comma in it, and that led to a series of punctuation mark uh, paintings, including this one called Slit of Paint. Yeah, I mean, this is, these were now singular works. Uh, again, Mira was talking about the scale of these works, so 16 by 20, um, you know, incredibly rich, small, intimate. You come up to them with your body. You sense, you're, you're very aware 
of yourself looking at them. You're very aware of the proximity by which they work. Um, they give you only an inkling of what they're doing from any kind of distance. And so they are very much these kind, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, come here, kind of painting, you know? Uh, slow painting, but also like quiet painting. Um, but then also quiet painting that kind of slaps you in the head when you get there, you know, or to Roberta's point, maybe pokes at you a little. Um, but these uh, paintings, which again are as much painted as inscribed, as much written, as drawn, as painted, um, and all of the spaces, all of the gestures around the cursive language are extremely considered. And they feel bodily and they connect to flesh not just your flesh, but the flesh of uh, a history of oil painting. You know, we remember de Kooning saying that oil paint was invented to paint, you know, the human body. Um, and I was clear that you were aware of this and felt maybe uh, similar, but coming at that from a different, a different <laughs> angle. Um, and, and then, you know, a work like Lack, which is another phrase that has, you know, a variety of... Uh, potentialities. Um, I'm painting this condition. The, I'm painting the condition potentially understood as a woman's condition, but also a powerless condition. Um, wh where am I? And you're painting it in a way that I've often described as menstrual, for lack of a better phrase. Um, you want to talk about these uses <laughs> of words? Okay, well, we're on a well, roll we're here. On a roll. Stuart, we're, going, um, we're going for it. Um, the, these paintings, actually, the, the, the paintings of the word lack came from a series of color paintings. So it started with like red, um, yellow, sepia, black. But since I was blowing up my handwriting, then lack popped up. And in a sense, the, the theory language that I was reading was a still life, um, was my still life subject matter at that point. So, um, and it's, <laughs> yeah, so there is that sense of... Um, of embodiment, you know, certainly the embodiment of text or bring, bringing the two together. And, and this is somewhat non-traditional. It's ink and gesso, so it's, it's, I, it may have a little bit of oil, but not, not that much. I use a lot of different media at this point, although primarily oil. But, um, and so this idea about uh, the ways in which language is speaking to various conditions, um, you know, leads us into a, a, a work. We have one or two examples of this, a work called Oops. Um, uh, not, another work. Well, one of the interesting things was just talking to Mira about these these um, selections. I said, "Listen, we should definitely pick uh, a few oops paintings." And we got into this sort of hysterical discussion. Of, well, do you want a delicate oops? Do you want the oopsiest of the oopses? <laughs> um, and there is something sort of very uh, wonderfully absurd. Um, but the other thing that struck me looking at these again was, in a way, a crazy connection to ideas about abstract expressionism again, and the idea about, you know, mother well, let's say mother well, and the, and the motif, you know, a Spanish elegy motif, or seriality, the mm -hmm. idea that you have worked on singular word works or punctuation works, and you've done, ver uh, uh, in a sense, theme and variation. Uh, I, have the, I have a motif, and I'm now going to explore it, and this one's going to be super drippy, and this one's going to be very restrained, and this one's going to be super colorful, and this one's going to be very... Uh, uh, dark and, and mysterious. And so could you talk a little bit about the idea of re repetition and the idea of using or coming upon a word that you want to paint and paint over again and paint over again? Well, um, first of all, I think that the link to abstract expressionism is there in that each paint and the issue of seriality together. Um, and at that time, I was using, I, ha I had kind of matrices of, that I was using to start the paintings that would emerge from just writing out a word, blowing it up, having all these you know, Xerox, large Xeroxes around the studio, not act but then doing it freehand. So I was both um, appropriating my own language, my own handwriting, but also um, doing it freehand. And so there was an element of mechanical reproduction, but not done exactly mechanically, except for the color Xerox. And on the other hand, as someone once pointed out to me when they came to the studio and I was talking about my process, and I basically said, you know, at a certain point, the painting tells me it's finished. 
which means I was finding the painting. And they said, oh, you know, what an abstract, expressionist, old-fashioned you know, <laughs> way of doing things. But that, that is still the way that I work, in that the painting is a planned accident or a planned event in some sense. And at a certain point, I do it, and I respond to it. And these paintings came at a kind of, I would say, a strong point in my life where I had achieved enough confidence in oil that I was desperate to lose control over. I was always trying to lose control over oil paint, except that I had some control over it. So, um, but that was a pleasurable point, that sense of um, wanting to put myself out on a limb. And Oops was also about a kind of positive moment of more forgiveness to myself for making mistakes mm -hmm. and not being perfect and which I was in my late 40s when I did that I could I could begin to have that little bit of freedom about myself I think so yeah so here is a painting that is uh, not only a call to an idea about modest painting but is indeed a modest painting so coming off of the, the earlier comment a second ago about giving yourself a certain kind of license to kind of go for it, to maybe feel relaxed enough to say, I'm going to make a series of works about this uh, slippage, this oopsiness, this you know, kind of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, here's a work where you're really, in a sense, making a painting that declares the kind of thing that you would have said and did say in writing. And so the notion of making this work and having your ideas be written. Again, now, this is, is, this is not appropriated language. This is a return to your language and a very straight uh, presentation of I'm writing this out, I'm painting it, and I'm presenting this theoretical framework for the kind of work I want to make. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing it in the work. Talk about modest painting. Talk about what, that, what you hope modest painting can do. This is... This is a, it's, it's, it's one of the few paintings that's, a declarative, that's representing a, de, a declarative sentence. And um, I was working on a book that became a decade of negative thinking, it, and it did take me a decade to write. So this was in around 2000. And I had so many, I don't know what I was doing at that point, but I, I felt like I was not going to ever get to write the book because I was busy. And I thought, well, I could just do it as sort of cliff notes um, you know, drawings that would be um, just one or two sentences, and that's how the spirit, that painting came about. Um, the full first sentence of the essay is, uh, I'd like to put forward the notion of modest painting. It won't put itself forward because it is inherently resistant to the self-commodification actively encouraged by contemporary culture. Um, and I think that connects also to the public and private. Um, the the paradox of being someone with that Hasidic background of my father, which had a tremendous strain of humility in it. And these are not necessarily things that were ever told to me. I, I, I learned them through reading about the tales of the Hasidim of Martin Buber. And um, so you learn about your own life over a long period of, of time. And, um, and it is a paradoxical painting because it is putting itself forward, but it is a modest painting. It's not even really a painting. It's just, a, it's just ink on gesso swept once. Um, and um, so it's, you know, it's on the borderline between uh, both my practices and um, that issue. The one other thing I would want to say about modest painting now is that there's, there's, so much talk about, um, well, there's, I was thinking about this yesterday and listening to people talking about what they thought was, uh, at some panels at the College Art, what they thought was exciting uh, today. And a lot of it was not, not just not painting, but not even object making, not even really art making. Chris Krauss gave a talk where she talked about all these great young artists at the University UC San Diego, one of them was like learning ancient Armenian in order to translate. I don't know, I, I mean, I, my, my brain's wave started to like break up a little bit. Um, but it was all very interesting, but it had very little to, to do with what I was doing. I thought the thing is, is the painting is thought of as um, being implicated in autonomy, which is a bad word right now. The autonomous artwork is a bad word because what we want to do collective work and social practice. And, um, and it's also caught up in a political moment, which I totally 
um, believe in and am part of, of Occupy, that would also support that idea of collectivity. And, and on the other hand, painting is seen as the major medium of the art market, and which is something I've never benefited from. And my little modest paintings are, you know, don't have, they're not colorful, they don't have tits in them, and they're not a million dollars, and they're not fun, done by a guy. So, um, so here's, here's this strange little practice that I'm trying to, to maintain. So this painting continues to have a resonance within my own practice. I'm going to shift to this painting and a series of paintings that, that come upon the idea of a, the lack of language, what can't be said thoughts not expressed, words and comments unspoken. And so a series of thought balloon paintings, a series of, of speech bubbles, which while robustly painted are in a sense voided or emptied. Um, and so after working with language in this very particular way, you, sh you shift here to, uh, you know, if, if uh, in a way I remember seeing some of these works and thinking they had great resonance with like, the work of Myron Stout kind of stubborn, tough, like very resistant in a way, painted in an extremely uh, solid, loose hand. The paint is extremely, uh, <laughs> Guy Goodwin would appreciate. Um, but this idea about what can't be said, what, what you weren't putting into these paintings, the absence of language, because we're going to get to a return in a, in a moment. But this idea that there hit in its, in some level of uh, period around 9/11 as well, um, but but ideas about you know like uh, the lack of ability to speak. Well, these were done after my mother died, and um, I had been working with language for about 15 years, and um, and I think I was getting a little tired of it. I was getting tired of dealing with how people feel about artists who paint language. And, um, but after she died, I felt, first of all, I wasn't, I really felt that my existence as an artist or my identity as an artist was kind of up for grabs because of the relationship that we had around art. But also people would say to you, how are you? And you're supposed to say, I'm fine. But actually, I thought there, there are no words for how I feel. Grief is wordless. And I sat down and just painted a blob, which turned out to be the cover of, of a decade of negative thinking. So I started at a kind of back to the simplest pleasure, in a sense, which was just to paint a blob of black ink. And that grew into these thought balloons, which began to look like heads. This is called Portrait of My Brain. Um, Unlike Myron Stout, I, I, I admire him tremendously, but it's, it was a very fast painting. Um, it's a slab of Naples yellow. Um, and, you know, there was this, that ad, um, this is your brain on drugs, this is your brain on grief. Um, but, but in doing so, I healed, I, you know, I would say that I healed myself through um, the work itself and doing the work. And then it led to language entering back. Well, I mean, when you use the, the when, you know, when you describe here's a portrait of my brain, um, we're going to look at now a series of, you know, a handful of mo uh, fairly recent works. Um, and I was struck by, again, this kind of legacy to a history of artists, to the idea almost of a, a kind of Philip Guston kind of reawakening of Guston as a uh, director, the Guston who moves out of abstraction and um, moves firmly back into his great love of the past and uh, basically says he now wants to make images, and he's interested in making images, and he's implicating himself and his world and his life and his marriage and everything in the series of images that he's now uh, presenting. And, and uh, you've described this figure. Um, well, I'll ask you, how, how did this figure come about? This Well, the thought balloon looked like it was sort of a head, and then I wear glasses, so I started doing these more like blockheads, empty blockheads with glasses because it's so much part of my an unfortunate part of age that I can't read anything or eat my food without these reading glasses. Um, and, but it, I, and I returned to figuration, which was something that was very unexpected for me. So the last time I'd really done it, not, ta not considering the penis paintings and stuff, but actually having a little person in the work, not since graduate school. And I never thought I could do that again, um, but I returned in a more cartoon-like way 
Um, I admire Guston tremendously, and I would say that that is, um, that is a point where it's resonance and influence also. Um, I'd be, and, and even the, those small Guston paintings, mm -hmm. amazing, yeah. And so, you know, you, and these are, we should say, as much painted as, as drawn. I mean, they feel or as, more or, or, or as drawn, much drawn as painted. As painted. As painted. Yeah. Um, uh, again, working with ink, working with gesso, working in a very much more direct, much less labored, in many cases, mm -hmm. way. Um, we're just looking through a series. And, and the way in which you can be responsive to current events, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what is the dreams of all of us, and how does this figure, this what you've called an avatar of yourself, operate within these paintings? These are slightly bigger in many cases than the 16 by 20 format, but still yeah. relatively small. And so, um, you know, and, and talking about seriality, you know, let's look at an image like this and an image like this. I mean, so notions of working from painting to painting, uh, changing, morphing, canceling. Um, what is working like this uh, allowing you to do? I, I find that I've been able to speed up, or I'm, in, I'm intentionally trying to speed up the relationship of all my practices between writing and painting, between reading, drawing, to painting, so that it all, it, you know, in an hour I can go from one to the other and they're connected. Um, the, if you go back to the, 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 the space where painting was, I'm reading Nicolas Burio's post-production under a tree, and, um, and then I'm creating essentially a cartoon about relational aesthetics and um, video projection in relation to matter, the materiality of, of my own practice. And then if you go on to the dreams of all of us, it was my effort. Um, to deal with Occupy, and um, it's a big challenge for an artist who is, the, the whole notion of the political in art is such a complex one, and um, it's come up in a number of panels that I've been to about black art, and, and do you represent, that was the issue of femi you know, feminism as well, do you represent the body, do you represent the identity, or do you do something else? And with Occupy, I, it was a particular challenge. Although, how can I, how, I have to do a work about this. I want to, but how do I do it? And I was very struck by this, the notion of sleeping and how the metaphor of these people who were sleeping in a really gritty, it was a gritty embodied thing to do. It was not an easy thing to be down at Zuccotti Park sleeping on cement and um, surrounded by traffic and people and photographers. And I thought these people are doing this for us. So they are, they are dreaming for us. They are sleeping for us. It was an incredible act, generative act of generosity. And so I did a series of paintings of the dreams of all of us. And I, I chose uh, three out of a series of four. So that was like darkness. And then I, I decided to give it a positive ending. This was after Zuccotti and... Um, last spring when we didn't know what was going to come next. Um, I think, they're, I think that what they're generating continues to be generative. It's made a tremendous transformation. Um, this was the last work that I chose. It's the most recent work I've done. I did it the night of, her, of Sandy. And I luckily was spared. Not everyone in this room was as lucky as I was to, to be spared. But... Um, at the height of the storm, I was able to be liberated from all of the things that prevent me often from working. Um, and I did this work, which is part of a series of works that I call the expropriation series, where um, a figure is been thrown out, fallen out, um, is being blown over, um, has their head stuck in the, the earth, of a stormy night, and um, but the language is appropriated from a very annoying correspondence I had with a student. But I, I see this as the thing where I, I make a former student, I make um, lemonade out of lemons in the way that I use the area of denial. Um, this, this, I'll just tell you the story. I think we have just enough time for me to, to tell this. Um, 
because in a way it, it also points to the way in which patriarchy and sexism continue, even though everything seems to be different and better, but yet they continue. So this former student who's a Marxist or fancies himself a Marxist wrote me an email and asked me if as a faculty member at Parsons I would um, babysit, essentially. He needed a faculty member to babysit a conference he was doing. And he said, in, in, he wasn't asking me to be on the conference, but in payment, he couldn't pay me, but in payment I would be allowed to ask a question from the audience. <laughs> so uh, conferring with one of my call, friends and colleagues, Lenore Mellon, she, I, I bit my lip and I wrote back and I said, I'm, very, I'm sorry, I'm very busy. Um, I'm going to be doing this and other things. And he wrote back and he said, I'm glad to see you are keeping busy. <laughs> and I again bit my lip, and instead of writing him and saying, that is the most sexist, ageist, um, condescending thing you could write to a former teacher. I mean, it's marginally OK to say to a little old lady who's taken up macrame. But, um, <laughs> but then I thought, well, that's actually, in a way, so true to the moment now, where people are being discarded, you know, or where you, you know, the next thing, you know, it's like, First, you're teaching Parsons. The next thing, you're, you're at Walmart, you know, being a greeter. Um, so, um, so that night, of, so I'm very fond of this painting because it's my most recent painting, and it captures the way in which things that are actually kind of desperate and dark also can connect with humor and where it happened. The, the, there wasn't actually an underpainting, but basically I did this painting in an hour and a half as the winds were howling around me, and as I didn't know that the wave was coming up on people and houses. Um, but uh, so that's, that's where I am right, right now. Well, well, where you are actually right now is here. Well, so, I, that's where I was. Um, we can just maybe, <laughs> our, our last question might be, um, this is for people who know, uh, people who connect to Mira on Facebook or other things. This is an image which actually sort of you're ringed by the various things that, and this was a little while ago, so some of the things that are around you here uh, have changed. But uh, this is very much a portrait of being busy, maybe being too busy. Uh, and so can you, t because one of the most interesting things, the negative, the decade of negative thinking, the year of positiveness, that's been, uh, you know, I think embraced by a lot of people who know Mira's blog. Um, using Facebook, connecting to people, a different kind of community, you know, not, not maybe the meaning community, but a sort of like blown out uh, public, private. <laughs> Can you talk about this image and the various things that you are always juggling, the transitions and maybe what's coming up as a way for us to end and you to start? I mean, there'll be some time for yeah. questions. Um, well, the, I did this in 2005. It was like a little project at, school, at the beginning of the school year. We, we used to do like a little, self, everybody was asked to provide a small self-portrait. And that particular year, I was juggling writing a decade of negative thinking, editing the writings of Jack Torkov, taking care, teaching, painting, and um, being an emotional support for my mother who was wonderful but, you know, needed some help and was then 94 years old. Um, so I did the self-portrait where everything that I was involved with was um, coming out of my head. This was the source of the thought balloons. When I, when I went back to zero after she died, then I returned to this um, portrait, which I later used as my first Facebook pic you know, little picture. Um, so there was um, other lectures, 94-year-old mother, laundry. This is the life of a woman artist. Basically. Laundry, Parsons MFA, my job. Um, uh, visual projects, painting, and then life is like the smallest thing. It's just this little thing poking out of my head. Uh, my book on art, which is a decade of negative thinking, the Mets, food, the Torkov book, and then the last thing is really my next project, which is book about parents' art. But what I'm hoping to do is to write what I'm calling, a, it's a project that I'm calling a cultural autobiography, but it certainly, and it would be written but a kind of photo essay that would begin really with their story. And I think only when I'm done with their story, which I feel is a very strong legacy, can I come to my own story. Um, so that's the, if I were to redo it, then I would have to eliminate 94-year-old mother, Torkov book, et cetera, but book about parents' art would right. So I think we should, I mean, I want you to recognize that Mets up there, 
does, is not going to allow me to ask Mira about baseball. I could ask Mira about Star Trek. I could ask her about the New Yorker, Zabar's, and a million other New York and elsewhere centered uh, things. Maybe that's another talk. That's another talk. Um, but we probably have time for one or two questions. And